welcome to another webinar Wednesday brought to you by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Today we are talking about corrosion mitigation methods for marine structures. As I said, this program is brought to you by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. We are a coalition committed to advancing best practices in the field of concrete preservation. We draw on our members to get speakers to promote education and awareness of concrete repair industry standards, new and innovative corrosion prevention technologies, and sustainable construction practices. This is the last of a four-part series focused on the preservation of marine structures. Previously, we've covered parking structures and an extensive series on bridge preservation. You can find the recordings and presentations uh, to all of those webinars on our website, wesafestructures.info, in our events tab. Chris Ball will be giving us the presentation today. He is the Senior Vice President at Vector Corrosion Technologies and with over 25 years experience in cathodic protection with a specialty in concrete rehabilitation and corrosion protection systems. Uh, he's uh, definitely got a lot of experience in talking about what he's talking about today. Uh, you can also see he is certified with NACE. He's a member of ICRI and ACI and currently chairman of the ACI 3, or sorry, E706. With that said, I'm gonna let him take it away. Okay, hopefully you can see uh, see my screen. And um, thank you, uh, thank you, Ben, for the, uh, for the introduction. And I wanna thank everyone who's taking the time out of their, their day, whether you're in the afternoon or the morning or in the evening in some locations. Uh, we appreciate your uh, your attendance. Um, and as Ben mentioned, this is the, the, the last of the four part series in preservation of marine structures. And uh, today the topic is uh, corrosion mitigation methods uh, for, for marine structures. So uh, just a brief outline. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the corrosion of reinforced concrete. Um, the types of cathodic protection systems used, and I'll do this in mostly in the context of, of some project histories and examples. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about impressed current cathodic protection, galvanic protection, uh, the uh, two-stage uh, fusion technology, and then uh, we'll wrap up with a little uh, uh, project that shows how Cathodic prevention can be used in replacement structures. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. If you're wondering what that picture is, that's a picture of myself um, standing inside uh, uh, one of the uh, FRP shells that would be used to provide a galvanic uh, jacketing system. So uh, we'll take it on from here. There we go. So. Um, just a little bit about, about marine structures in general. Uh, you know, the last seminars we've done were on bridges and we did one on parking garages. This one's specific to marine structures. Um, and marine structures are very important, obviously, uh, type of infrastructure, but they're obviously uh, unique. Um, just looked up a little information online and there are um, over 370,000 miles of coastline uh, globally and one third of the population lives within 60 miles of the coast. So you see, you know, the marine structures are very important for us. Uh, they're important for obviously transportation, uh, global trade, uh, security, and they're a driver for local e economies. And so just, uh, you know, see a, a few pictures there uh, showing, and this one in particular I thought was, was interesting as a project that I looked at a few years back where you had some uh, con reinforced concrete piles that were subject to uh, corrosion. And you can see that the repair method here was to basically cast a, uh, a dense uh, silica fume concrete uh, overlay around the jacket to try to repair and protect it. And obviously some of these repair methods don't really, as, as this, really address the underlying corrosion issue. So corrosion occurs and eventually these types of repairs can, can have reduced longevity. Um, another picture, particularly this one on the bottom right, um, just shows the severity of corrosion that you, we can get in the marine structure. 
you see a significant loss of section. Um, in fact, complete deterioration of some of the stirrups on on the beams. And um, you know, so if we don't address the structures in a way that we can prolong their service life, we can also run into major structural issues down down the road potentially. So um, as you saw in the previous picture, corrosion is very, uh, very much a reality in the marine environment. And so just as a little bit of a background and information uh, and so we can develop a common understanding of, of corrosion of reinforced concrete, we will go through a few, uh, few slides here to, to discuss that. So a few years ago, um, NACE, the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, uh, that sponsored a, a corrosion study and found that the uh, the cost to the U.S. economy, I know we got people from all over the world, was, was estimated around 6% of the gross domestic product. About half of that was direct cost and the other half was indirect cost. So whether it's 6%, 3%, 10%, you know, corrosion is obviously a very important and significant uh, factor for for the economy and you see there on the left the uh, significant corrosion of a of a concrete uh, pile in salt water and this is the corrosion of a underside of a, of a marine pier so you know when we're dealing with uh, bridges and parking structures like in our previous seminars a lot of times the corrosion is due to de the use of de-icing uh, salts um, but with the marine structures we're primarily looking at salt water and so what, what's happening with the salt water uh, exposure and why is it causing the corrosion of uh, the reinforcing steel and concrete? Um, you know, salt water, the composition contains chlorides and other ions that are, that are corrosive to metals. And you can see that every day when you have bare sheet pile or other types of steel structures around, around salt water, you get a lot of corrosion and, and oxidation. With regard to concrete, um, concrete itself is exposed to the chlorides through the direct wetting or atmospheric exposure. So um, the, just the direct wetting from submerged or tidal or splash areas um, or um, the atmospheric exposure, you'll see sections, that use, even buildings along the coastline which aren't necessarily uh, in the water are experiencing corrosion of the reinforcing seal just through atmospheric exposure to airborne chlorides over time. Um, the tidal and splash zones are have intermittent wetting and drying, so they are even more vulnerable. And um, so you have this, you know, application and drying of, of chlorides uh, it, and plenty of oxygen availability to drive the corrosion process. So they're very vulnerable. The chloride penetrates through the concrete pores. If you think about concrete, um, a lot of times I use the analogy, it's like a hard sponge. And so the chloride ions can move through the pores of the concrete over time. We see concrete is very, is very dense, but it's relatively porous. And it depends on obviously the quality of the concrete you know, mix design as well. But it also moves through the cracks. So many cracks and structures would um, penetrate down to the reinforcing steel, and that's an entry for, for chloride penetration. Um, but the good, the good news is that the concrete itself provides alkalinity around the reinforcing steel, which provides protection for a while. But generally over time, when you get sufficient chlorides to the level of steel, the chlorides went out and deterioration will, will start to begin. It's important also to note that after the corrosion initiation, corrosion accelerates over time. You can imagine the, the chlorides, can, you can, there's more cracking, there's more exposure, uh, there's more concentration of chlorides, there's actually some acids generated around the, uh, around the anodic areas, and so there's an acceleration of corrosion. So once it initiates, you'll see uh, a, a, a propagation period. And then Further, many of these structures are in elevated temperatures and they're in uh, tropical environments or warmer, warmer client, climates. And just the fact of being in elevated temperature areas accelerates the corrosion process. It speeds up the chemical, electrochemical reactions. So just an illustration of the corrosion cell in concrete. 
Here you see the reinforcing steel um, and, uh, and and a concrete concrete make matrix. When the when the concrete's poured around the reinforcing steel, you'll get an uh, initial formation of a passive film. The, the steel will, will corrode a little bit in the alkaline environment and create that passive film. And as I mentioned before, that alkalinity in the passive film is buffering the corrosion from occurring until you get sufficient quantities of the chlorides, which are indicated by the hatch lines here. So once you have enough chlorides around the reinforcing steel, that's when the corrosion initiation occurs. And the areas where you see the active rust formation um, would be called the, the anodic sites. And the other part of the corrosion cell are the cathodic areas. And these can occur in the same bar, or here we're showing a mat to mat uh, type of corrosion cell. Um, and what happens is that the steel starts to uh, effectively corrode, releases the electrons um, to a more cathodic area, an area that becomes more passive over time. You have an increase in alkalinity through, through the generation of hydroxyl ions at the, at the cathode. And so you and you have this ionic path through the electrolyte, which is the concrete matrix. So now you have a corrosion cell. You have an anode, you have the electrical path to the, the cath cathodic area. You have an ionic uh, conductivity through the concrete and the passing of, of, of corrosion. And at the anodic site, you have an expansion of, of, the, of the volume of the steel for the corrosion byproducts. And as we know, uh, concrete is strong in tension, but it's weak in compression, so that these tensile forces um, uh, can start to um, effectively break the, the concrete cover and allow cracking and spalling and, and deterioration. So like I said, concrete is weak or is strong in compression, weak in tension, and that's what's causing the initial deterioration. Now, once corrosion initiates, and we saw some more severe pictures earlier, you lead to major issues. Um, we also can see this phenomenon occur where uh, you have these uh, differences in chloric, more abrupt differences in chloride concentrations between new concrete or concrete repairs and existing structures that are chloride contaminated. And this difference in chloride concentrations can cause a difference in potential uh, between, the, the, between the areas, which can also cause additional corrosion. And if you go back, sorry, just for a second, you see on this, um, this is an example of a, of a, of a, a repair on a marine pier or a, a column in a marine environment. You see more deterioration around that and you have some more areas that have been marked out. So while the, this area, the repair itself is relatively passive and should be passive because you've removed the chloride contaminated concrete, you see this progressive corrosion that occurs in areas around the repair if there's sufficient moisture chloride, et cetera. We'll talk about that a little later, in more detail. So that's a little background, I think, that would be helpful for us, you know, when we start to talk about cathodic protection. Um, if you go back and you think about the corrosion site, uh, slide I was showing, the illustration where the anodic site is the area where you have active uh, rust formation, the, the air areas of the, of the cathode in the corrosion cell, those areas are being actually being protected from corrosion by the corrosion at the anodic site. And so when we start talking about the use of cathodic protection, is that we're trying to force all of the steel to become a more of a cathodic in, in nature, which is uh, a reduced or elimination of, of active corrosion damage. And so um, there's basically two different types of cathodic protection systems that have been used for years. Um, talking about ships and pipelines and other tanks, um, but you know these uh, types of systems have also been used for um, for reinforced concrete. And um, this is an illustration of the first one is impressed current cathodic protection. Basically, impressed current cathodic protection um, is, a, is an electrical system that's applied to the into the structure to address active uh, corrosion or to prevent the initiation of corrosion. And with an impressed current cathodic protection system, uh, you're using 
an artificial anode, uh, basically an inert anode that's embedded on the surface of the concrete or inside the concrete. And then you have a low voltage DC power supply that is creating a voltage difference between the ICCP anode and the structure itself. And that rectifier basically takes AC power, converts it into DC, and creates that, that voltage difference. So once you apply the voltage difference and the, the anode and the cathodes are in the, in the same electrolyte, you effectively have a, a flow of protective current that flows off of the ICCP anode to the reinforcing steel to uh, basically slow down or stop the natural uh, corrosion activity that, that is occurring in the, in the environment. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, at the steel, the you know there's a, a passivity that occurs and you a generation of hydroxyl ions which further improves the alkalinity around the steel but you also have a natural tendency for the chlorides to be pushed away from the steel and attracted toward the the, the source of the of the cathodic protection so effectively what we're doing is that we're pro providing a, a current to, to slow down the corrosion but we're also improve over time over years, providing a, an improve, a significant improvement to the environment around the steel uh, from a passivity standpoint. So um, with galvanic protection, you know, a lot of the same benefits are, are occurring, like I just mentioned, um, but uh, this occurs more naturally and we're using the dissimilar metal corrosion kind of theories to provide the protection. So instead of having this exterior uh, power supply that's providing the voltage difference to the to the structure and between the structure and the anode, we're actually using a, a dissimilar metal that's directly connected to the reinforcing steel and the concrete. And that difference in potential is your driving voltage that, that effectively provides the protective current that flows from the anode to the reinforcing steel. And so selection of the right metals is important in order to ensure that your protection is, is occurring. Um, and over time, the galvanic systems are sacrificial in nature. They have a, you know, a, a, a limited service life. They have kind of a limited voltage. You can't turn them up or down, but they also come with the a little bit more simplicity and lower maintenance as well. So there's a trade-off and there's a place for all types of systems. So just a little bit more about galvanic uh, protection. Um, if you look at the electromotive series, basically the potential of metals, uh, there's always there's metals that have are more natural in the environment versus metals that are more um, have more energy in, uh, placed into them. They all kind of fall different uh, places on the galvanic series. So if you see at the bottom here that more noble metals are uh, are like, for example, gold obviously lasts uh, a lifetime, and more, uh, more uh, or more active metals or least noble metals are more like magnesium, zinc, and aluminum. Those are those are typically used as galvanic anodes to provide protection to other metals. So in this scenario, you see the illustration. You see zinc and co uh, and copper. You have zinc here, copper here. You see a voltage difference between these two. Zinc is the more active metal, and zinc is going to be providing the sacrificial protection, providing a flow of, of electrons to the into the to the structure to provide protection, and that's effectively the basic idea of a galvanic protection. So those are the two, just in general, two types of protection systems that we that we typically see for uh, or technologies for um, uh, cathodic protection. Um, now we'll dive into a little bit more of the detail with uh, some project examples for which I hope you will, will enjoy. So let's talk first about impressed current cathodic protection. So this project uh, was interesting. It's, uh, it's a project that was uh, completed a few years ago and uh, in uh, New York, Brooklyn, New York. Um, and effectively it's a, a retail um, a structure that's placed on uh, elevated platforms. Um, you have these buildings on the platforms and sections of the, 
of the, the retail building are based over uh, out over the salt water, which is in, in the adjacent bay. And so it's a relatively long structure, 800 feet with varying width, widths. And the, the, the substructure here is, a, is cast in place concrete beams on various types of piles. Now you had five feet difference between the, the beams and the high tide. So they weren't necessarily directly in the tidal zone, but they were subject to splashing and, and airborne chlorides. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, there was a couple of previous repairs that were completed in 1995, 2005, but the corrosion continued to progress and the owner was interested in a, in a, a solution, a longer term solution. So this is um, just a, an aerial view of the location. You'll see there's Manhattan. This is the, the building in, in the Brooklyn area. And you'll see from the, over the, the area view how the structure uh, overlooks or is built out over top of the, of the salt water. Now, in order to provide the long-term uh, solution, we really needed to take a look at, okay, what's really the source of the, of, the, of, the, of the problem, how widespread it is, and what's the magnitude of it? And then from there, you have the information to, to provide options. And, you know, the, so basically starts with a more in-depth um, corrosion evaluation. So this is something that's more than just a visual, uh, a visual look at the structure and looking for damage. We're going to be looking for obviously damage, but also how widespread is the corrosion issue fundamentally, even in the sound concrete areas. So, the, you know, the chloride threshold holds were, were very high. Um, and, you know, some of them were even 20 times as high. That's That could have been in a, in a cracked area, but um, there was definitely sufficient chlorides present to initiate corrosion. We also did some carbonation testing and, and you know, had, now carbonation is basically a loss of the pH of the concrete uh, from the from the atmosphere side and it moves in to the structure over time. And so there were some areas of, of carbonation depth up to two inches. And what that effectively means that any any reinforcing steel that's in that carbonated zone would have less a lack of alkalinity to support that the fight against the chlorides um, and makes the structure more vulnerable to corrosion. Um, corrosion potential testing, uh, there's Previous webinar was done on evaluation methods. You can go back and take a look at that. But effect effectively, corrosion potential has indicated a high probability of active corrosion. And not only that, but it was over widespread areas. Um, and then, you know, when it all comes together, uh, cathodic protection was needed to uh, address the corrosion issue. Um, so looked at different options for for the structure. Uh, you know, you could use galvanic anodes in, in uh, encapsulation repairs, which uh, basically would be an option. We can kind of show that as later uh, an, an example. Um, you could look at custom discrete anodes, you know, put into drilled holes that are sacrificial um, galvanic systems, uh, metallizing, um, basically an anode that's sprayed on the surface of the concrete. When it was all said and done, the owners uh, and their consulting engineer selected the impressed current cathodic protection route because it offered a low life cycle cost and the owner was committed to the system monitoring and maintenance to make sure that it's effective over its lifetime. So once that was uh, was selected there's multiple types of anodes that could be used for impressed current and cathodic protection the anodes are um, anywhere from you see on the left here could be an example of a an anode like a titanium mesh anode which would be put on the surface of the concrete with a concrete overlay or shotcrete uh, there are different types of titanium ribbons that can be put into slots but what was utilized on this structure was a effectively a discrete impressed current anode that's made um, out of a ceramic material, uh, has a high current capacity, and it's just specifically designed for concrete and masonry structures. And so those anodes are embedded into the body of the concrete. Um, they are wired externally to this power supply, and the power supply is also uh, has connections into the reinforcing seal. So we can create that that um, uh, uh, voltage difference that drives the cathodic protection 
uh, to the reinforcing steel. And so just a few uh, photographs from from the from the project. Uh, obviously, this is a section you're you're out over the, the bay and um, you have the building on top and you have the concrete beams is the basically the grid of, of beams and um, and all of the um, all of the access to the contractors were provided by uh, suspended uh, scaffolding. Now the the anodes are placed into the beam and as mentioned they're they're placed into the center of the beam and um, effectively provide protection to all of the reinforcing steel surrounding the anode. So if the beam is small enough, you can put the anodes in on one on one face and without having to put multiple anodes from, from different areas. So it's an efficient uh, type of protection. So as you saw in the previous slide, the anode itself has a, a, a header wire that comes off of it. You see here that, and then it, it connects to a header wire. Those are welded together and then um, effectively used an epoxy uh, grout material to conceal the top of the anode. Um, the anodes themselves were placed into uh, the holes using a cementitious grout that's conductive, but we used an epoxy grout on top to, to top off the hole and to fill in the slots which conceal all of the anode wiring. Um, and then you see what it looks like when you when you finish. You see the the distribution of the anodes themselves, and then the the uh, um, some some conduit etc. That's going to be making um, the anodes uh, can the anode system and zone connected back to the the uh, the electrical system for for operation. So that's the completed section. The number and spacing and size of the anodes and all the zoning, those and, and selection of the, the capacity of the rectifiers, that is all typically done by a, a cathodic protection specialist who was involved in this project as well. And as I mentioned, you know, the owner was um, long term owner and there's monitoring required. So there's a series of uh, rectifiers that were used with uh, remote monitoring capabilities where you can preset certain limits if the if the the system kind of goes outside those limits. You have notifications and you have online access to all of the, the data. Um, so that's a, an example of a, an, an impressed current cathodic protection system. Now we'll talk a little bit more about galvanic protection. We talked about before how zinc was providing protection to the copper in our little uh, test tube um, kind of setup. Um, but when we're specifically, we, we start thinking about reinforced concrete, the most common anode metal that we're using is for particularly for embedded systems is zinc. And so you see zinc has a natural potential of a little bit over one uh, volt or uh, 1100 millivolts. And your reinforcing steel and concrete is in the range of you know, 200 or could be more positive than that, even maybe down to a negative 500 millivolts. And so whatever the, the, the difference between that potential is the driving voltage. And you'll see the zinc starts to provide the sacrificial protection to the reinforcing steel. Um, over time, you know, the zinc is uh, providing excess electrons to the steel and you have this passage of the ionic current that's occurring through the concrete matrix itself. Now, it's important to note when we're looking at embedded systems that if you just used a bare zinc anode in, in the concrete and you connect it to reinforcing steel, it's going to be relative, the zinc itself is going to be relatively passive. This is a graph that is showing the corrosion rate of zinc compared to the pH. And, you know, concrete is going to be in the range of 12, and over time it may, may drop when exposed to carbon carbonation. But however, if you look at the corrosion rate, the zinc itself is going to be relatively passive at, at that pH. So while that may be good if you're looking at like a galvanized zinc coating, in these kind of scenarios, we want the zinc to be active. And so it's important for us to basically create an environment around the zinc that is some that it's allows the zinc to be active, but it does not provide any corrosive materials to the reinforcing steel. 
And so that basically you're utilizing a, a matrix around the around the anode that's going to push the the pH up 14 or above. So you see that the the corrosion rate is going to be very active for the for the anode system. And many of you guys may have seen these before. You know, originally were called the hockey pucks, um, but have been around for a long time. Um, uh, this is one of the Ill early illustrations that we that we saw, and the um, zinc metal is cast around tie wires. You have this high pH matrix that surrounds the zinc, and that keeps the zinc active. And that's what those tie wires are connected to the to the reinforcing steel, and it basically works over time. So here's an illustration of where you'd use these the the small anodes, where you have this interface between a concrete repair and the adjacent chloride contaminated concrete, you see you have this difference in potential, which dr could drive new corrosion outside the repair. When we install the embedded galvanic anode, it has a much more electronegative potential than either the steel in the, re the, uh, in the, in the repair or outside of the, of the um, in the contaminated concrete. So now we're effectively trying to keep that anodic site from being shifted to the area outside the repair. And like I said, for over 20 years, these types of anodes have been used, you know, for concrete repairs. And here's an example of a repair of a bridge structure. It's in saltwater environment. You just have some corrosion that's occurring on the bottom sections in some isolated kind of repair areas. And these attach directly to the reinforcing steel and the repair is completed and you're providing little localized areas of protection around around the anode. But as I mentioned before, it's really just not repairs. It's also, you know, areas where you have this a difference in new between new and an old concrete. These are interfaces that are created by also by modifying the structures. So on the left here, you see a, an addition to a deck. You have an existing deck that is chloride contaminated, you have a new section of deck, which would be new concrete, and you have a potential for corrosion right at that at that joint. And you see anodes used along that face. Here, this is an example of a, a modification of a, of a pier where you have a large uh, concrete pile, existing pile, that with the, with the steel coming up into a new um, beam um, that is being built. And so you have this inner, you will have this interface between the new, uh, new concrete in the beam, the existing um, chloride containment concrete in the pile underneath, and just use some anodes right at that interface just for localized protection. Once again, it's not solving an overall corrosion issue, but targeting the protection to an area where you have a vulnerability and a potential vulnerability in the future. Later, uh, these types of systems kind of, uh, also were used for a different, a different uh, configuration were used to be placed into drilled holes into, into concrete, into sound concrete. So just not being used around the repairs, but also being used through the repairs and into the sound concrete to provide a little bit more widespread protection based on the same type of technology. A further advancement of, the, of that type of anode system is being able to make the anodes larger and larger. And that's when we start looking at distributed anodes. And here you'll see these uh, green anodes. Um, these are referred as distributed anodes. Sometimes you'll see them called strip anodes or rods. But um, effectively, this is a project in to uh, Tokyo where you had widespread contamination and deterioration uh, corrosion on the bottom side, the soffit area of a of a slab over salt water. This is an industrial pier at the port, and um, ultimately the the decision was made to remove the the chloride contaminated concrete, the uh, deteriorated concrete, um, utilize a, another layer of reinforcing steel, which will provide additional you know kind of strength to the structure, and utilize the galvanic anodes, the distributed anodes within that repair area and they're basically connected back to the existing steel and the chloride contaminated concrete and they can also be connected to the new steel to provide uh, corrosion mitigation to the new sections as well. So this is a very comprehensive type of solution. 
Now, just a little bit about uh, a, a little bit more comprehensive case study on, on this type of system. We look to the Port of Canaveral. Uh, this is a project that was completed probably close to 15 years now um, ago um, at the North Cargo Piers the, on the east uh, coast of, uh, of Florida near Cape Canaveral. Um, so um, effectively, you see that the, the structures were built in the, in the mid 70s in the handle bulk cargo. This uh, this port probably more well known for cruise ships, uh, uh, but uh, they do ha handle uh, cargo and uh, other types of commercial uh, traffic and such. Um, the structure had been in place for uh, just about 30 years when they went when they decided they needed a major rehabilitation of the structure. And the structures, the repair design life was effectively a 20 year repair. Um, and, you know, they realized that the original structure was, was in bad shape after 30 years. If they wanted to get another 20 years out of it, you're going to need to provide some additional protection to the to the steel. And you see some of the uh, ideas of the, the uh, illustrations of the existing condition. You know, lots of corrosion of the of reinforced concrete piles. These are pre-stressed um, pre-stressed piles. Um, then you also had the pile caps, which had um, were cast on top of the the pre-stressed piles. Um, most of the corrosion on the pile caps were on the lower sections, which were close to the water. Uh, they're the lower sections, but they also are fairly heavily reinforced in those areas. And then the pre the precast deck units, which were also experiencing some uh, some active corrosion. So for the pile cap repair, um, this is a typical detail where you see the active corrosion um, and you know any types of supplemental uh, reinforcing can be can be added in and it needs to be addressed. But from the corrosion standpoint, basically the methodology was used to remove the top or, or the bottom um, eight inches of, of concrete to expose the, the steel. And then to use the distributed anodes were placed, you know, end to end, kind of throughout the repair area, one row on each side of the of the pile, and then it, the concrete was replaced with a form and pour concrete repair. Here's an example, a picture of the before and after, where you see the the anodes that are installed onto the prepared concrete surface. And then the forming system with the bird mouths that was used for uh, form and pour uh, concrete repair to rebuild the concrete that was, det that was taken out and then encapsulate the, the anode system. And once the concrete is placed, the anodes, the zinc anodes, uh, which are alkali activated, were um, start to work immediately. And the um, here's more of a, a, a pan. Of the of the structure, you see the anodes placed across the beam and the completed and the completed repairs. As I mentioned, you had the deck protection that was provided by alkali, or sorry, activated arc spray zinc, um, and these were on hollow uh, precast hollow core precast slabs. Uh, effectively, 20 mils of zinc was metallized on the onto the structure. We also utilized a humectant activator, which attracts more moisture to the zinc concrete interface. And then you had a uh, inorgan or inorganic zinc uh, top coat that was provided to protect the zinc anode on the surface from, from corrosion. And you see a significant amount of area was completed there. So here's a just a look at some of the equipment. You basically have two zinc wires on um, reels that are fed to the applicator tip. These are energized when the wires come together. They, they have a, an arc and compressed air that blows the the zinc onto the onto the surface of the metal. Um, in order to make the connection and assure that the all the steel is continuous in the precast, a continuity groove was was made where you and that continuity groove had the metallized anode sprayed in it. Um, and then across the entire surface. And that provided your uh, global galvanic protection. And then you know for the um, for the pile and jackets, uh, about 600 over almost 700 piles, uh, pre-stressed concrete piles were jacketed. Um, you basically remove the damaged concrete, install the jackets around with the jackets have zinc anodes inside the jackets and also submerged anodes uh, underneath. 
And that is a one step kind of repair with a stay in place FRP forming system. Uh, there's lots of different options and uh, for jacketing systems and, and more than I have time for today. So I would encourage you to go to look at the um, uh, previous webinar that's being posted on power protection that was done by uh, Jason Chodacek from Vector. And one thing just uh, interesting to note that you know, if you take a look at the benefits, you know, and obviously the, the structure was was protected and the service life extended. The um, but if you can also look at the environmental benefits, uh, if you go to we save structure.info, there's an environmental impact calculator. You can put the volume of concrete that's being kept in place and it'll give you the calculations for how many tons of solid waste and is, is avoided and how many, for example, tons of CO2 production was prevented. So this project re received the uh, re the award for um, ICRI for the Award of Excellence in 2007, and then was also resubmitted after 10 years later uh, uh, a review of this of the systems, and was also received a longevity award from ICRI. And there you see the the photograph of the structure, uh, probably 10 years uh, after the fact or so. All right, so. We talked about impressed current systems. We talked about galvanic systems. The next thing we're going to talk about is the uh, fusion two stage system, which effectively uses impressed current and galvanic in the same anode. In the, in the example that we'll use here is the port of Corpus Christi. It's in Texas. It's a major port uh, for the um, export of energy uh, from uh, for oil, um, uh, gasoline, fuel oil, et cetera, from, uh, from Texas. And uh, so it's a very important, uh, import, important uh, port facility. And the, the subject here is a project that included two oil docks, uh, four and seven. Uh, both of them are similar in, in that you have major amount of piping that's going from the into into the, the dock for the transportation of the of the cargo. And so the basically the, the structures themselves are two levels. You have a level that supports all the piping and then another level for everything, everything else. So the original plan on the on this project was to reinst reinstall the, a metallizing system that was on on the beams. And you obviously with uh, with the, uh, uh, the the hazardous cargo or not or flammable at times, there's a lot of safety concerns with the metallizing. Uh, limitations for hot work and open flames. Um, there's environmental concerns as far as dust generation and and, and metallizing. Those can be addressed, but um, uh, we want to basically contain any dust generated and and, and collect the uh, the zinc from going into the water um, that comes off of the structure. Um, and then, but more importantly, there's a lot of site constraints. So there's very limited amount of work work time that was uh, able to be. Um, uh, available at any one time. So basically you, you take all these things in consideration and the cost to do the, the systems were probably beyond what the what the budget was. So as an alternate um, an approach, uh, the fusion two stage anode kind of system is 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 utilized. And as I mentioned before, it's a, a self-contained um, system, the ICCP. Uh, first, for stage one, you get a, a, a period of ICCP from the internal ICCP system, and then it automatically switches over as the ICCP system drops off to a galvanic maintenance mode. And these are just these are basically designed uh, typically for a 30 year anode anode life. And here's the different stages. You have active corrosion. You have the, the phase of, in, of impressed current. And then, which is designed to be sufficient to passivate the active corrosion, and then it switched over to the galvanic corrosion control or, or cathodic prevention to keep the passive uh, nature of the steel in place for for the period of time for the design. Here you see the anodes being installed in the structure. Um, you basically have a um, chipped out pockets to um, do a riveted connection to the reinforcing steel. A header wire with uh, anodes connected uh, in like a daisy chain and uh, grounded in place. And then you'll have a, another connection to the steel at, at the other end. And generally, you'll have somewhere between 10 and 20 anodes on, on, a, given, on a given chain. 
I read, it's similar to the project in New York, put on a grid pattern. One th thing that's interesting about this is through the design process, you can vary the spacing of the anodes to achieve the current density that you need. So if some sections of the structure have more steel or in a more corrosive condition, you can have a tighter anode spacing and, and just the opposite in other, in other areas. So it has a lot of flexibility in use. Um, because you're in a situation where you, you have unexpected interruptions from the ships uh, or maybe um, just short notice that you need to pull off the construction site, this is a nice system that you can install discrete sections and, and pull off the site. And even when, the, even when there's, if there's no hot work time, then you can still do some of the grouting and other, other work that's, uh, that's safe to be, to be done. And there you see the, the anodes installed. You see some of the old metallized coating still in place, kind of put into the center of the column. And then your, your connections to the reinforcing steel, you have the riveted connections. The red wire is the header wire. The, the green wire is coming off of the anode. And those are connected with a uh, sealed, uh, sealed connection and all grouted into place. And there's your grouting, your grouting operation. And then, uh, and then multiple, multiple sections of these are monitored. So they're using a, a monitoring box to uh, uh, basically break this. Uh, it's in line with the system so that you can measure the amount of current. Uh, there's embedded reference cells to see the, the level of polarization and the performance of the system over time, anytime that you want to interrogate the system. And then you see a significant amount of savings. Um, with this alternate approach, but more importantly, the, the, the original schedule is maintained with minimal disruption to the uh, to the, the operations of the of the port. All right, just a few minutes left here, and I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, also utilizing um, cathodic protection in conjunction with with uh, replacement structure or, or new construction. You know, sometimes there's just, you know, situations are such that the structures need to be replaced. And um, and if you want to achieve a specific um, types of, of service life requirements, then, you know, one option is to actually uh, utilize uh, cathodic protection, uh, whether it be galvanic or impressed current. And as I mentioned before, earlier on in the in the um, um, in the kind of the introductions, you know, over time, the, when, when steel's per, receiving cathodic protection current, you're building up alkalinity around around the steel. So effectively, you're, you're over over the decades, the steel becomes more and more passive over time. So it makes the it very not only like during the time that the anode is active, but even over time, the structure is becoming more more passive. So there's definitely a place for this type of, uh, of, of approach. And just uh, uh, an example I thought was was interesting. This is in Astoria, uh, Oregon. It's in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, it's uh, effectively a br some bridge replacements for a, a rail line or street for a streetcar like a trolley, and uh, provides uh, the trolley system provides uh, access to the waterfront and to the waterfront businesses. Um, over you know the original construction was over a period of hundreds of years using existing timber piles that were being replaced and had continuing levels of decay. So uh, what the owner decided to do is to scrap the, the, the timber pile kind of solution and actually go with a, uh, a new structure, replacement structure, and they had defined that they wanted a 75-year design life, and it's a 75-year design life in the marine environment. And so the solution that the contractor went with was uh, precast concrete pile caps on steel on steel piles, and uh, and it's interesting just to note that the the precast concrete piles were actually uh, the lower sections of the piles were actually submerged at, at, at different periods of times at high tides. So in that type of environment, um, how do you achieve the service life? Um, well, they went with the precast kind of solution for the accelerated bridge and uh, construction. And then the, the quality of the precast along with some, some galvanic anodes let, can help you achieve the long-term durability. And this is the, the precast sections that were being built. Um, and you see just some galvanic an anodes, the distributed anodes, just in the, in the lower sections of, of the precast for, 
provide supplemental protection. And there you see the different uh, sections of precast here on the right. They're being placed on top of the of the steel piles, and um, and then over time they're all interconnected to make the the substructure. Um, to protect the steel uh, piles themselves, um, a, uh, a galvanic system was used there as well. It's uh, effectively a uh, zinc um, sled system, and so these are a series of 130 pound or so um, uh, sections of, of zinc anodes that are put together on on a sled and laid in the bottom of the on the on the, ocean, on the seabed and um, and those all those sleds are connected to, to the steel piles through an external um, junction box and so once the salt water you know comes back in when the construction is complete um, those zinc anodes are active and providing active uh, passive passive protection to the to the to the the steel pipe piles. Here you see you know more of the construction in, in, in process, and then eventually um, that is that's been replaced. And so um, and just one you know this is a, a nice uh, nice example of utilizing really more like a targeted protection. You know we. The whole structure wasn't trying to be protected with cathodic protection, but anywhere where you see that you might have uh, vulnerabilities from a corrosion standpoint are areas where you can use some supplemental anodes uh, or anodes in the structure to provide supplemental protection. And uh, the Astoria Charlie Bridge Replacement Project for the city of Astoria, Oregon, uh, received an award. It was the from the Daily Journal of Commerce top projects of 21. Uh, for infrastructure. So uh, uh, just an interesting uh, example of using um, anodes and a new construction or replacement structure. So just uh, just to recap, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, corrosion or reinforced reinforcing steel and concrete. Uh, we talked about impressed current cathodic protection. Uh, we utilized an example of um, of the piers in um, in New York for the press current system. Uh, we also went to galvanic protection. We talked about the Port Canaveral project, uh, which is a 20 year kind of service life system and uh, utilizing various types of galvanic protection for the piles, the pile caps, and the underside of the precast deck units. Uh, we talked about us utilizing the, the fusion two-stage anodes, which are um, Impressed current and galvanic uh, to provide a 30 year 30 year anode life for uh, a pier in Texas and some targeted um, galvanic anode protection for new construction in Oregon. So with that, Ben, I'll turn it back. We got a few a few minutes left for questions, but I appreciate your your time and uh, and, uh, and interest. Great presentation, Chris. We've actually got uh, a lot of really good questions in here too, so I'll try to get to those as fast as we can here, so we can get uh, get these get these answered. Um, got a good one here uh, with uh, with the zinc anode uh, corroding inside, like the sacrificial anode uh, corroding. Do you have to worry about the increases in volume from the corrosion byproducts causing potentially causing cracks in the concrete? Yeah, that's a that's a it's a good good question, and because we talked about how the reinforcing steel um, corrodes and expands um, the and cracks the concrete. Um, what you find is that um, the zinc anode itself does have some expansion when it corrodes, but it's a significantly less amount, and um, that small amount of, of expansion is actually accounted for in the, in the design of the anode. So I, I mentioned the, the matrix, the cement matrix that goes around the body of the anode, which is uh, designed to activate the anode, to keep that anode in the, in the alkaline and uh, highly alkaline environment. That is also um, is part of the design to deal with the ex expansive corrosion products of the zinc. The that is that th those those corrosion products are soluble, and the the mortar has a fair amount of porosity, so those corrosion products effectively just move into the body of the of the anode itself without causing cracking to the concrete cover. 
That's a great answer because I think you were able to answer somebody else's question at the same time. They're asking how the cement matrix uh, around the zinc would promote corrosion of the zinc core. So uh, with that, I think we can uh, count those two as answered. Um, another one from another Chris uh, with go galvanic Chris. anodes. Sorry, go ahead. I said go Chris. <laughs> Uh, Chris said, uh, when uh, galvanic anodes are utilized and tied to existing rebar, how is continuity of the rebar tested to ensure it protects the entire column? Yeah, that's a that, that's a very important um, point. And um, whether you're util utilizing a, a small type 1 anode in a repair or you're going all the way to a full cathodic protection system, you are still that that point is is uh, valid, and the reason is is that you have this interconnected um, nature of the reinforcing steel in in the structure, and but you're not connecting to every bar in the cathodic protection system, so we need to rely upon that there is some what we refer to as electrical continuity, or effectively an interconnection that you have all of the steel touching each other. Um, and so that it all receives cathodic protection current, whether it's from a small anode in the local area to the larger the larger system. And the way you test for that is you, if you're do, using a small anode in a, in a repair, um, you would uh, effectively take a multimeter and you would test for between the bars that in the areas that are ex exposed in the repair. And you test test for continuity. You basically touch the, the leads on, a, on multiple different bars and make sure that you have no resistance or little resistance in that in that circuit, which indicates those bars are electrically continuous. If you're on a larger structure where you have a lot of sound concrete, you may do some testing within the repair areas, but you also need to go to um, test large you know, between bars and sound concrete. And it's not practical to test all of the bars, but You'll go from one extreme to the other um, and test from the top of one beam to the bottom of the other and vice versa. So you understand that there's a continuity of the steel throughout the structure. Lots of clients specify a definite life extension. Do you have any case studies or data to showcase um, some of our, our work in the past? Yes. Um, there's lots of uh, lots of data. I know that there's there's an upcoming there's like lots of existing data, but there's also an upcoming um, session at at the NACE seminars in, in the spring where there's a specific session on performance of uh, galvanic systems, in particular for reinforced concrete. So there's lots of lots of information out there, um, and even you look at the just even today the Port Canaveral project itself. Um, that project is close to 15 years old and which is i guess um 50 of the original time the structure was built it was 30 years when we first did the re repairs now it's additional 15. um and there's been a series of um visits back there for additional testing on for example on the piles uh, pile jacketing system so th there is uh, there's plenty of information and if there's anything in particular that you're looking for, just let, reach out to uh, me or any of the business development staff that we can, we can help you on that. All right, I'm going to do one more because we're running out of time. But uh, are these same corrosion mitigation methods applicable for protecting steel sheet piles? Yes, um, but with, with a little bit of modification, if you think about the last uh, project example for the port, I'm sorry, the uh, Astoria, and you saw the bulk anodes that were used on, on the anode sleds, um, you'd probably end up using a system similar to that to provide protection to the steel sheet piles that are in the submerged areas. Um, so you can use impressed current systems or galvanic systems depending on the case, and you have to understand if the sheet piles coated or uncoated, and there's, there's a, a bit of design that needs to go into that. The challenge you have on sheet pile a lot of times is the area in the tidal zone and the area in the atmosphere. And uh, we're seeing more opportunities to provide really kind of encasements to those areas where the you're 
it's similar to like a, a, a pile jacketing system, but in case it's in that case, it's more of a panel system that goes into those areas and the and in the space between the anode and the steel sheet pile has 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 uh, is filled with with concrete. And so when that, when the water is down, there's anodes in the, uh, along the structure themselves that's per, that are providing protection to the tidal zone and the atmospheric area. So yes, there, there, there's a lot of similarities, but um, you probably more heavily are relying upon uh, the bulk anodes in the submerged sections. Awesome. Well, we are out of time for questions, but we will definitely get these uh, all to Chris and he'll do his best to answer them for you and get back to you. If you have any more and you weren't able to get them in uh, during our session here, you can reach out to Chris at the contact information on your screen. This was the final episode in our Marine series. We will be also starting up again in the new year with a uh, more of a how-to style webinar um, on how to design a galvanic cathodic protection system, uh, followed by uh, creating or designing systems for new construction. And with that said, I think we are at the end of our presentation. Thank you, Chris, for doing such a great job. Thank you, Ben. And uh, uh, also just wanted to say once again, thank you to the attendees and the people who may be watching this in the, in the future for your interest in saving structures. And um, today is uh, December 14th, so we're just starting to head into the holiday season. So I'd say season's greetings and let's get out there and save some structures. Exactly.